Thank you, Pastor Alicio. What a joy it is to be in the presence of the Lord this morning. Have you felt the Spirit of God in the house? The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You've been fighting a bad attitude through all of this stuff we've been going through? There's liberty for you today. Cast out the bad attitude and decide I'm going to be a nice person from here on out. With the help of the Lord, of course. You've been fighting your temper? Well, this is where there's liberty to get, to get that under control. What else have you been fighting lately? There's liberty in the house to be free of those things that drag us down, tone us down, keep our praise from coming out. Many years ago as a teenager, I was struggling. You know, this is pastoral uh, appreciation month in 2020. That's what they tell me out there somewhere. But uh, every, every month is a pastoral appreciation. Can I get a witness? And as a teenager, I was getting tripped up, stumbling, and really feeling like I was uh, not a very good Christian young person. And of course, if the devil can, if a demon can sense that you are in that place, with all of their iniquity and wickedness going on, they're ready to jump on your case. You're right. You're not doing any good. You might as well throw in the towel. And the Lord gave me a dream. As a teenage young man, the scene was at our youth camp, campgrounds, and Brother Gray was sitting in a car, my pastor, David Gray, and he called me over. I went over to see him. He was sitting in the car. I came up to the driver's window, and he said, to me, David, I want to tell you something. If you're, if you fight, you battle, you're tripped up, you fall. If you fight like that all day long, I want you to know something. If you're up at the end of the day, you've won. So I found out the answer from my pastor. If I trip, I'm going to get back up. If I fall flat on my face, I'm getting back up. If I struggle, I'm getting back up. Hallelujah. Thank God for a pastor that knows how to help us in our journey. And this great church, this worship place, has got a fabulous pastor, in case you don't know that. He lives what he preaches. He walks with God. He lives for God. His wife is right along beside him. Worshiping, praising God, praying. You've got a wonderful team. Don't take it for granted. It, does, it doesn't happen all over the world. we got to appreciate those people in our life that help us battle through the difficulties of life. It's a joy to be with you. Every time we come, we, we go home blessed. Here's uh, the love of my life. careful pushing around. <laughs> I am so happy to be here today. We always love to come to Greensboro. I don't know what to really start with today. I'm only going to say a few words. <laughs> but I'm fixing to. When my daughter was young, now this is just info for you. When this beautiful woman here, Melody Lynn uh, Elms, Alicia, but <laughs> when she was young, you know, you get 18, and you're looking around at the guys. Well, when she'd look at one, Mama was back there judging them. <laughs> and I'd always, if I didn't really like the feeling I got, I'd always kind of discourage her and, oh, Melody, you know, or whatever, <laughs> and it would make her so mad. And I didn't want her, I really never wanted her to even date the guys if I didn't like them. <laughs> 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 
It does hear a bit. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, we went to a general conference, and I don't even, I wasn't planning to tell this, but we went to a general conference, and she was down there, and they had called all the preacher's kids to the altar at the end of the service and have them to come up first and dedicate and everything. So Melody was t trotting down there to the altar. Well, this young, handsome evangelist, <laughs> the minute he, I don't know, but I watched him, and he, she went down there, he followed right in behind her. Well, <laughs> we didn't know a thing about this guy, but I looked at him, I seen black hair, I was up in the balcony, and I says, told my husband, now I'd always been afraid to let Melody date, not because of anything wrong, I just didn't like the guy. <laughs> and so <laughs> she says, I said, honey, that's more like it. <laughs> and you know, it's amazing to know how God wove those two together. Melody got so angry at me when I wouldn't like a guy she wanted to date. But I just couldn't help it. <laughs> I had to fall in love with the guy, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and when I seen him, I fell in love with Lee and Alicia. Amen. I was way up there. He was this high to me. I was way up there in the balcony, and I seen him. There was something that hit me. I think Melody had a special thing about her is why God put such a guard in my heart. He had a special ministry for Melody. And the one to lead her and help her through it all was that sweet, handsome Italian. <laughs> she got mad at me one time, and I don't, <laughs> sorry. But she got mad at me one time because I <laughs> wanted her to like him. Well, she was thinking about it. You know, and going on and everything. So I found in a magazine, I found a picture of this guy. And he had come to visit for a week or so. And it said, no, it was a bottle of liquor. <laughs> <laughs> and it said, the Italian you'll never forget. <laughs> I cut that thing up. I went in there, and he had sent her a little picture, and she didn't think it was good looking of him. And so he was in California. She's in, we in North Carolina. So he sends <laughs> uh, her this picture. She says, oh, you know, she's real picky. Oh, I don't know if I like that or not. I got so angry when she went to school the next day. I pinned up, found this thing in a magazine, and pinned up that picture <laughs> of, of that saying and put it by his picture. The Italian you'll never forget. <laughs> That made her so angry, but I'm telling you what, Mama won. <laughs> and of course, he won my beautiful daughter. That's why I was so picky of him. But he was the only one that passed the test. <laughs> and he has been such a blessing to our family. Amen. He has loved my daughter beautifully. They have made a powerful, godly team for God. And I'm thankful for them today. One more thing I'm going to just say. I thought of it this morning. It kind of lifted me up. Uh, you know, this COVID thing's about to get to me. Wearing these masks and everything, you feel like Zorro. But I said, <laughs> I was thinking about my life and kind of measuring it up. You know how you do every now and then. And I thought about the Bible says that there's one talent Christians, five talent Christians, and is it ten talent? <laughs> one talent, two talent, and five talent. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? When, and I thought of all God's people. And I said, you know what? When we get up there, it's not going to mat matter so much that we're one talent, five ta uh, two talent, and five talent. We're going to all just love each other. Amen. We're going to all just be as great as the other one was. We're going to all shine and when the Lord God Almighty walks into our presence, he's not going to weigh us by all that type of thing. We are going to be filled with glory. 
And so I said, don't be discouraged today if you think you're just a one-talent Christian. Don't worry up there. Just do your one talent. Do your two talent. Give it five and double it if you can. But God, we're doing it for the Almighty, and we're going to meet him one of these days. And I love the house of God. I love Greensboro. I love my new grandson-in-law. He's just grandson. I better quit. (laughs) God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Brother Joe's coming right now. Uh-oh, looks like somebody's doing something. It's a uh, special appreciation day, I guess. Um, so it's a pastor and family. But I'm going to set these right here. Because you know if you ask me to do something, you're getting all of me. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Alicio, oh my goodness. I love to listen to that story because um, it's so awesome to have someone in your corner. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I've known this family for two decades. And the best thing Sister Alicio ever did was pick this guy. <laughs> this guy is awesome. He, you need someone in your corner directing you putting you on the right path, even though you might not know it at the time. Pastor Lisa has been in our corner for 30 years. I mean, we just come through this rough time with this COVID and this year. And I mean, Pastor Lisa has had to, we had to make changes. We had to get the cameras. We had to get online. We had to do all these things. It, 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 you do not really appreciate being in management until you've been in management. And I'm telling you, it is tough. Because every decision you make, there's going to be someone that's not going to like it. And there's going to be someone that's going to say, yeah, okay. But the thing is that the Bible says that we're on a trial. Your faith is on trial. Yeah. And, it, and it, it has to do with the Bible. And it also has to do with the, your family, their church family. Uh, you see so many scriptures in there. You, the elders, I mean, uh, young ones obey the elders. Obey the ones that had the rule over you, you know. There's so many things in the Bible, you know, that, that, that we're going to be on, tr- that we're on trial for. It's great to have this man in your corner. I have been there so many times. I can say I went to this man in his office, and he told me to do something. And I said, I know you was going to say that, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it my way. I know what that's like. Let me save you some years of trouble. Don't ever do that. If he says, I think, you know, you might want to think about that. Think about it. I promise you. When you go to this man and, and you, you, you let him be in your corner, you, you ask him, you say, don't say, don't go to pastor and say, pastor, I'm called to preach. Go, pastor, am I called to preach? What am I called to do? He'll tell you. He's in your corner. He's there to help you. I love pastors preaching. I really do. But my favorite thing is that classroom at 10 o'clock. I come in. I am tired. I drove 68 hours. I drove all night to get here. And I am so tired, it's unbelievable. And sometimes I'll speak in that class, and, and, and I'll think, what in the world was I just saying? And he'll come up with something, and I'm like, you got that from what I just said? And he'll make me look like I'm a genius. You know? This is who you want in your corner. Come to that class. If you really want to know Pastor Alicio, come to that class at 10 o'clock. There's so much knowledge and wisdom there. It's just, get, here we got this man to be in our corner. All you have to do is reach out to him, touch him, go to him. If you got a problem, go to him, Pastor. I got this problem. I I don't want you, I'm going to come to you next week and let you know how it goes this week. And when you're accountable to someone, you get him in your corner. When you got a corner, Sister Alicio had her mother. And, 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 just to have someone to help you and guide you is so big in this life. I love y'all so much. I love Greensboro, and that's why <laughs> he can say anything he wants to say to me now. <laughs> okay, that's all he's going to get from me. We love you, sir. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Here, sweetie, take this. Just, just say hey to everybody. Hey. 
Thank you so much. I did not realize it was pastor's appreciation, but we appreciate you too. I don't know what day is the people of God's appreciation unless it's every single Sunday. I know I feel your love and I know you appreciate us and we deeply appreciate each and every one of you and what you bring when you walk through the door. It's not just you. It's not just your problems. You bring your spirit. You bring your worship. And you bring your love. And never let the enemy undervalue what you bring when you walk through those doors to the house of God. You bring your guardian angel. You bring your spirit. You may even bring defeat. You may even bring failure. But this is where the hospital is. The hospital, you don't have to wait five hours in the, rece- in the waiting room. You walk through the door and the people of God begin to sing from the last row to the front row. And your voice whether it hits one note or not, is favored of God. And you will be find your healing. And that's why we come. Even when we fail, even when we feel defeated, we come. Because the person right next to us feels victory. And you know, when you're in psychology, they tell you that if you put a depressed person on one line in the room, like a telephone, and you put a person that's not depressed on the telephone in another room, the one that's depressed spirit comes to the one whose spirit was fine. And if that doesn't teach you about the supernatural, nothing will. Spirits talk without saying a word. And if someone that's depressed when you're not even speaking gets on the phone and then this one feels depressed, Mm -hmm. that's why we walk through the door. We come to a place when we're down and we're defeated and we haven't seen victory. And we sit next to somebody who has. Or we sit next to somebody who's had an even worse week and somehow our spirits communicate without any words and we always leave feeling better than we came. Thank you. I love you all. Lord bless you and bless us this morning. Why don't we stand together? We're going to dismiss our Sunday school. Appreciate everyone that's here. The amp did come back on. God is so good. You didn't know it, but our team labored under a amplification problem. Perhaps you noticed it. If you didn't, good. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor say, I'm glad pastor doesn't preach long. But I wouldn't be doing you right if I didn't give you what the Lord gave me to share with you today. I want to turn to Habakkuk chapter number one, verses one through six. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou will not hear. Even cry unto thee, of violence, and thou will not save. The message version, they're not going to show that to you, but I'll read it. It says about that verse, how many times do I have to yell, help, murder, 
Somebody call the police. Verse 3 says, Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me. And there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Behold ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously. This is God speaking back to Habakkuk's complaint. For I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe. Everyone say not believe. <laughs> Though it be told to you. <clears throat> this is what the, uh, the message version says about that last verse. Look around at the godless nations. Look long and hard. Brace yourself for a shock. Something is about to take place. And you're going to find it hard to believe. I'm about to raise up the Babylonians to punish you. Verse 6 says, For I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. And then in Psalm 51 and 8 it says, Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken, may rejoice. I want to preach from the subject when God does the unbelievable. Let's join together and ask God's blessing upon his word. We love you, precious king. We thank you for the word of God. We pray that the power of your spirit will be felt in this house in Jesus' lovely name. And everybody said amen. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Today you're going to get a lesson on how to dance with a broken leg. You're going to learn how to worship with a limp. When Jonathan flew off the platform, I must admit, a moment of doubt entered into me, and I said, I'm glad that's not me. <laughs> I'm not afraid to jump off the platform under the anointing. I'm just afraid to do it in front of y'all. Because the older you get, sometimes the more unreliable your physiology is. But everybody's been broken. I'm preaching, to ev I'm preaching to people that somewhere, at some point in your life, you know what it feels like to feel the snap. And to fall under the weight of what in better times you could support with no problem. But sometimes life hits us, and it hits us hard. And it hits us where we hurt. And we want to lay down. They say, if someone ever, especially if they have some age on them, breaks a major bone like a hip or a femur or something, they cannot get too comfortable to sitting in the chair whether it's a wheelchair, a chair, or a hospital bed, at some point in time, you got to get to moving. Because when the bone is mended su sufficient to hold the weight of the individual, then they should start using it even though it's painful. Oh, hallelujah. I'm here to tell you sometimes it even hurts to worship God. Sometimes in the face of unmitigated pressures and powers and resistance and failure, it's hard to say hallelujah. But if we learn 
to not move until we feel perfect. We're going to freeze in a church pew. And then we'll become unmovable. Somebody needs to dance on a broken leg today. Somebody needs to shout with a broken heart today. Somebody needs to lift a voice even though it looks like their world is falling apart this morning. Are there any broken worshipers in the place? That's what I want to know. If there are, would you give the Lord some praise? I have heard it told that you need to be careful if you ask for some kind of a prophetic ministry, at least know what you're asking for. Because people with prophetic inclinations are subject to agonies that otherwise would pass the average person by. Habakkuk speaks of a burden you can see. How many has ever had burdens you can feel? I think all of us have had burdens you can feel. And when you try to express to someone a burden that you feel, maybe sometimes you feel like, I don't feel loved. You tell that to someone and they'll say, hey, wait a minute, I love you, look, I'm here. I know they love you and that one loves you and that one loves you. How many people do you need to feel loved? And so they point to evidences. Or you might say, I don't feel successful. And a good friend will point out the fact that there's a lot of people that would consider you very successful. You have a successful marriage. You have a successful work ethic. You have strong moral character. You've succeeded in not ending up behind bars. That's a success. I'm telling you, I don't know what the prison population is, but they change places with you even in this church service today is where they are. But the prophet speaks of a burden you can see. Most of our burdens are felt burdens. But the prophet sees the evidence of God's displeasure. He looks around and is able to look in the actual world and pinpoint violence, debauchery, treachery, demonic possession, being overrun by a foreign power, threats to their welfare. In the 1980s and the 1990s, we preached about a lot about theoretical, you know, uh, casting out theoretical demons or defending ourselves against theoretical dangers or preaching about looming problems that are going to be on the horizon. How could we ever know that those demons are staring us right in the face today? 20, things 20 years ago we would have relegated at the time of great tribulation are among us right now. And if the church is not careful, it will get so pummeled by the forces of darkness that we fail to recognize that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they are mighty through God oh, to the pulling down of strongholds Habakkuk is in the grip of desperation Martin Luther said this about Habakkuk. The word, the name Habakkuk means embracer. It's one who embraces another. It's someone, he's a gripper. Now I know we got some gripers. <laughs> Griper and gripper spell almost the same, but there's a world of difference. <laughs> Another commentator put it this way. They said the word Habakkuk is not just the word of a sentimental uh, hugger, but it is the word of the embrace of a wrestler. Oh, yeah. 
I, I feel like I'm preaching to people that the only reason why you're still in the fight today is because you just won't let go. And if you ask my advice on what to do, my advice to you is keep on hanging on. Don't let go of your faith. Don't let go of your worship. Don't let go of your service to the Lord. Don't let go of your church attendance. Oh, hallelujah. Do we have any hanger-ons? Do we have anybody that's got a hold? I got a hold of what's got a hold of me. And I'm not letting go of it in the name of J come the devil, come hell, come high water. I'm not letting go of it. Oh, yeah. Hang on. And so we have to learn how to fight back because your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion. You got to watch the jaws and the paws. Because if a lion don't get you with his jaws, he can hike his hind legs and just eviscerate whatever the object of its attack is in just one sweep of its paws. But I'm preaching to people that we're going to fight off the jaws. The jaws of the enemy are going to come after you. Someone will criticize you. Someone will speak negativity into you. Someone will lie to you. The paws of the devil will come. Something that will just get a hold of you. You ever watch how a cat can grab something and it can't even make a, it can't even make a fist. It just goes whoop and it just sticks to it over here. So I, I read a little article on how to survive a lion attack. I thought I'd share that with you. Point number one. Don't run. I'll say that again. Don't run. Somebody needs to stop running and start standing. And the writer said the fastest human being ever clocked Hussein Bolt runs at a top speed of 27.79 miles per hour. A lion can run 50 miles per hour. You can't outrun the devil. That's why the Bible said when you've done all that you can do, stand. Don't you know you fight by standing? You win by planting your feet. You defeat hell by bowing up against the forces of darkness. If you start running from hell, hell will run you into the ground. This writer said if you run from a lion, all that's going to happen is you're going to die tired. Well, I got news for somebody today. We ain't dying tired. We ain't dying worn out. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Stand against the sin that wants to invade your life. Don't allow it to have a foothold. Cast it out of yourself in the name of Jesus. Point number two, don't turn your back. Lions expect their prey to turn their back. They're not used to things staring them down. Pardon me, let me just go through a little lion uh, taming practice. Come on, 
What are you doing that for? Well, because a lion tried to talk to your pastor. He tried to say coronavirus is going to wipe you out. You're going to go back 10, 20 years and have to rebuild the church all over again. You're going to run out of money. Tithers. You're going to have to take on some kind of an occupation to raise a dollar or two. You're 61 years old. You don't have enough time to accumulate anything to, to retire on. What are you doing? I'm staring the liar right in the face. And I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to prophesy before this whole thing is finished. We're going to have the greatest church we've ever had. They're going to swing from the light bulbs. They're going to praise God in the foyer. They're going to shout in the parking lot. We're going to cast the devils out of them in the altar. We're going to have apostolic revival. We're going to baptize them by the hundreds in Jesus' name. Everybody that comes to receive the Holy Ghost is going to receive it. Hallelujah. They're going to clean up their act. They're going to live right. They're going to put alcohol and drugs and wickedness down. They're going to... Oh, yes, they are. Don't turn your back. The writer said the reason why you don't turn your back is the great majority of lion charges are mock charges. This is a mock charge. You gonna run from that? You gonna run from a fake attack? 90% of Satan's assaults are false attacks. All you have to do is stand. All you have to do is not cave in to the fear. Hell needs you to fear to empower him to take you on. If hell can't make you fear and lose your faith, then hell's going to turn and run off and find somebody else to mess with. You better put your hands together here. Don't run. Don't turn your back. And number three. I didn't write this. Who wrote this? Rory Young, Safari Guide. <laughs> if you see a lion and you see stalking indications, raise your arms above your head and wave like this. And most importantly, shout. Your, I'm quoting, heads off. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I praise you. Hallelujah. Come on, shout out of your depression. Shout out of the spirit of poverty. Shout out of that loneliness. Shout out of that gloom and despair. Shout out of that carnality. Oh, I feel the hope. Oh. I'm halfway there. Can you hold on a minute? The Lord said in verse number five, remember, this, this book, three chapters long, is unique in many ways, but at least in this way, it is an actual dialogue between a man and God. It's a dialogue between a heartbroken man who seems to see everything he'd ever believed about God to be violated. Who cries out in the conundrum of demonic, satanic evil that's taking them over. And even charges, why aren't you doing anything about it? 
I know you've never said that. Let me read. I know you've said you've never said it. But we've all thought it. Essentially, Habakkuk is saying, I can't believe you're not doing anything. And God said, oh, are we going to get on the subject of unbelievable stuff now? Is that where we're going with this? Okay. I'm going to do a work in your midst that's so unbelievable that you're not going to believe it, even though it's told to you. Turn to your neighbor and said, God's fixing to do the unbelievable. Here's what he said. Verse 6. I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans. Some would say Chaldeans are demons. You think I'm not doing enough? I'm going to stir up the devil now. Look, I'm scared of almost nothing as long as God is on my side. But I'm terrified if the Lord changes teams. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans. And they're going to come and they're going to possess houses that aren't theirs. You think it's a problem for you to be attacked by the enemy? I'm going to let the enemy overrun you. Take your stuff. Move into your spare bedroom. Then move into your master bedroom. Kick you out your own house. And, and, and somebody's saying, pray for the pastor. He was prof This pastor's appreciation day got to him. Habakkuk was frustrated because of oppression. God says, I'm now going to permit possession. I know it's never happened in your case. There's nobody under the sound of my voice that's ever prayed about God taking care of something bad and it went from bad to worse. I know there's nobody that experienced like the children of Israel. They cried out in their bondage and it advanced to hard bondage. Or like when they were resisted by Pharaoh. No, you can't go. No, you can't go. No, you can't go. And then the next thing you know, he lets them go and then chases them down in the desert and pins them up against the Red Sea. Has anybody gone from resistance to all-out attack? Jacob wrestled with an angel of the Lord till the break of day. And he thought, man, I'm doing good to just hang on to this one. Till all of a sudden, you have to wrestle with your thigh bones snapped in two. The incarnation was followed by desecration on a level that's almost unfathomable. Just because a babe was born in Bethlehem, a slaughter was released throughout the region where thousands upon thousands of male newborns were killed simply because Herod feared a baby. When you think it couldn't get worse, oh, I just, I encourage you, then I depress you. <laughs> Welcome to my world. When you think it couldn't get worse, it does sometimes. Oh, the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. How many times have we encouraged ourselves with that? When I was a new convert, I didn't know any special songs. I knew the songs in the hymn book. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning. Thank God for his coming. Maybe we should preach his coming more often. He is coming. It's going to be glorious. Flanked by the angels, 
flanked by the redeemed of the Lord. But let us not remember, let us not forget, before he comes, Revelation chapter number 9 says, a star falls from heaven with a key to the bottomless pit and opens the gates of hell and from a bottomless, smoking, broiling, churning, undulating, lavenous pit comes these scorpion-like entities that sting and sting and they look like they they stung like scorpions they looked like locusts and they had crowns on their head you know what corona is crown I'm not saying that's corona, but I'm saying the world is preparing us for the kind of epidemics that are going to take control. We're living through the first stages of what those that don't know Jesus are going to experience in the time of great tribulation. What are you saying? Before Jesus comes back on earth, it's going to be hell on earth. And for somebody that might be experiencing hell, on earth right now I've got news for you God's not going to leave you like this oh my God oh hallelujah oh I feel the Holy Ghost in this house oh I want to do something okay here we go 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 what is that that's unbelief that's despotism that's demon control. That's wickedness on every hand. That's evil imaginations. That's last day's wickedness right there. And the writer said these words, God, when you do a thing that is hard for me to believe, I am going to return the favor and I'm going to do a thing that is hard for you to believe. Would you give me that last verse in Habakkuk 3 so I can read it from right down here? Habakkuk chapter number 3. Would you give it to us? Hallelujah. Though, yeah, can I tell you? Your disaster can end up in a song. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, though the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and though there shall be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Give me the last one. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet so that I can walk upon my high places. When God does the unbelievable and the enemy does what I never thought he could do, I am going to do the unbelievable. I'm going to walk on the trouble. Yeah. That's been troubling me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He gave me hind feet so I can crawl over the hell that Satan has put in my way and praise God. Somebody needs to walk on hell. Somebody needs to shout on the demon forces. Somebody needs to praise God, not because it's going good, because it's going bad. Come on, stand to your feet and declare yourself triumphant. You can go from sorrow to a song. You can go from a wipeout to a crescendo. You can step from a valley onto a mountaintop. Oh, this service wouldn't be complete with a moment of prayer. I'm opening these altars. Maybe you've been in big trouble. Bring your trouble up here in the name of Jesus. Bring your trouble. Ah. Shatalamaha, Shatalamaha. He wants to give you hinds feet. 
He wants to give you the power to climb. Step right on top of the trash, the garbage, the lies, the sin, the failure. Walk on it. Don't run. Climb. Climb. Watch this, devil. This is unbelievable. I should be backsliding over this, but I'm worshiping. I should be changing churches over this, but I'm planting my feet. 